morning. Man, you guys must have got lots of sleep last night. You're awake. I like to hear that. If you will stand, I would like to uh, begin reading some scripture. We're going to read out of Psalm 139 this morning. And it says, O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up, you know my every thought when far away. You chart the path ahead of me and tell me where to stop and rest. Every moment, you know where I am. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You both proceed and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to know. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous and how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. And then part of one of my favorite verses, how precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They are innumerable. I cannot even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up in the morning, you are still with me. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, you'll notice that we, we still have some flamingos down in our flowers. That was on purpose. This is to honor Edna. One last Sunday, uh, she, had a, she absolutely loved flamingos, so we let them stay one more week. But uh, that's, we didn't forget about them. It was on purpose. We did this. Well, as we sing Who You Say I Am, re- be reminded of what we just read in Psalm 139. That God knows our every thought. He knows what we're going to say before we say it. He goes before us and behind us. Um, and so when the world tries to tell us who we are, we don't need to listen. Because God has told us who we are. Amen? Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free. And Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father. Child of God, yes I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I Child of God, yes I am. In my Father's house, 
there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, always free. child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Amen. Amen. Why don't you turn and tell somebody about your father? Well, good morning. It is great to welcome you to the house of the Lord this morning. Are you having a good day? How many of you enjoyed the rain? I like the rain. The rain was good. I wished it was white, but it was just wet. Hey, a couple of announcements I need to share with you. First of all, uh, tomorrow night at 6, our, our monthly church board meeting will be happening upstairs in the uh, boardroom. So board members, just remind, reminding you, you'll be getting an email this afternoon from me that I would like you to read uh, before you come tomorrow. It's for our discussion time. And uh, so board members, please pay attention to that. I'm going to get my mouth to work yet today. Uh, Tuesday, 9 to noon at 10 o'clock or at 9 o'clock in the um, West Foyer. Encourage you to come to be a part of that. And then... Uh, if you're interested in baptism, we'll be doing baptism on Sunday, September 29th uh, here in the sanctuary. In, in, uh, I cannot get myself to talk today. Encourage you to uh, sign up for that. If you're interested, you can stick a note in the offering plate uh, or you can see me after the service this morning. We would uh, be glad to have you a part of the celebration of baptism. Also, if you're interested in church membership, uh, we'll be uh, doing a membership class in October, and you can stick a note in the offering plate about that. 
I don't have permission to do this, but I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm going to extend through today the uh, Women of the Well um, event this coming Saturday for our ladies. If you would like to be a part of that, you can still sign up if you get it in by tomorrow. Now, I'm in trouble already because the cutoff was Friday, but since Dawn's not here and Carol's not here to tell me, no, you can't do that, I just did it. Call Dawn in the morning if you're interested in coming and uh, let her know and we'll make sure that we get you in on the list. Uh, Pastor John's going to come and share some announcements and we're going to continue worshiping the Lord. Well, tonight we have a special uh, uh, missions dinner tonight. And so I have a couple of announcements from Cindy about that. She's in the nursery this morning. She said she needs help setting up tables. So right after Sunday school, if we could get the teen room set up for tables. And then this one's the big one. She said you need to make sure you bring lots of change tonight. She's playing a game that needs change. And it's going to be your change. I don't think it's poker, but you never know with Cindy. So bring your change and bring lots of it. And it's at 5 o'clock tonight in the, the teen room. Well, yesterday I had an opportunity to, uh, to go to a worship seminar at Tabor College. And um, one of the things that God showed me um, was as worshipers, and we are all worshipers, we're commanded to sing. And some people say, well, I don't have a voice, I can't sing. Let me, let me tell you what I found out. Hebrews chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 11 and 12. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same father. That's why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. For he said to God, so Jesus said to God, I will declare the wonder of your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among all your people. And what that tells me is that when we offer our praises, God hears Jesus' voice. Because of the fall, we had our relationship with God was broken. And so we have access to the Father through Jesus' blood. We also have access to the Father through Jesus' voice. So as we sing, it's Jesus' voice that the Father hears. Amen? So sing out like you've never sung before. Because... It's Jesus' voice that's going to be heard. So, and if you don't know the song, it's okay. The words are there. Make something up. Just go with it. All right? Stand with me. We're going to sing What a Friend. Now, this one's kind of fast, so hang on. <clears throat> Everybody knows heartbreak, isolation. Oh, 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 oh. But we can lay our burdens down. Our burdens down. Lay our burdens down. What a friend we have in Jesus. East to west, my sins are gone. Everybody's got worries. Oh, 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 oh. Everybody knows sorrow, devastation. Oh, 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 oh. But we can lay our burdens down. Our burdens lay down. our burdens down. What a friend we have in Jesus. East to west, my sins are gone. I see grace on every horizon. And forever and ever, his heart is my home. No more betrayal, for he is faithful. He fills me up and my cup runneth. Oh, my God. 
As we prepare this morning to go before the Lord in prayer, I don't know what kind of week you've had. I know what mine was like. I had three funerals. I had about a half a dozen meetings. And I was just playing running from one place to the other all week long. But you know what I found out? His grace was sufficient. His strength was perfected in my weakness. And when I felt overwhelmed and overrun and outdone and exhausted, guess what? He just kept giving and giving and given again. And this morning, that's what he wants to do for all of us. Amen? Amen. So whatever your need is this morning, we're going to open the altars like we do every Sunday, and you can come and share your burden before the Lord. If you have a praise that's just kind of burning on your heart, and you just want to shout and say hallelujah, the altar's a great place to do that. And so as we continue preparing our hearts for worship and prayer, let me just invite you, if you want to come, to come. Yeah. 
Father, we remember the story of the night on the Sea of Galilee as the disciples of Jesus were in the midst of a storm-tossed sea and how Jesus, asleep at the helm of the boat, was resting, unfazed, unworried by the storm raging round him. The disciples cried out, don't you even care? that we're going to perish. And Jesus simply rose and spoke those words, peace, be still. And the storm was over. And though God, the word does not say it, I just have to believe those words we just sang were ringing that night in the midst of their journey. It as well. This morning, through the blood of Jesus, we can confess it is well. No matter the circumstances and situations that we find ourselves in, in Christ alone, we can proclaim it is well. And today, God, no matter where we are, no matter what we're facing, no matter whether it's a trial or a temptation or a, a season of joy, we can proclaim in Christ, it is well. Hear the praises of your people this morning as we offer them to you in the strong, strong name of Jesus. Oh God, thank you. Father God, as we praise you, it gives us strength as we recognize all that you do for us to bear our hearts and to say, Lord, there are places today where we just need you. There may be some struggles or some strife. There may be some pain or some difficulty. There may be discouragement, maybe even depression. It may be in our lives or in the lives of someone that we love. There 
There may be needs, God, that only you have an answer for. We think this morning, Lord, of a couple of particular needs as we pray today for Richard Turner's son, Daniel, in intensive care, Lord, and uh, recovering from a motorcycle accident and even now in surgery. But we just pray, God, that you'd be with him. And God, I think today of, of one of our worship team members, Stephanie's dad, Dick, and facing heart issues today and this week. And we just pray, God, that you would be so near and that, God, you would just help him. Lord, there are other needs that we would dimension to you, and we ask now that you'd hear our petitions as we offer them to you in the name of Jesus. Father God, we exalt you this morning and say thank you for hearing and we believe answering our prayers. We praise you in advance of even knowing, God, how you're going to work. We praise you in advance of seeing, God, your fingerprints on the answers that you're giving. We praise you in advance, God, because we just know that every prayer that's offered is a prayer that you respond to. So Lord, hear our praise as we say thank you. We thank you also today, God, for the many, many ways that you provide for us. Lord, you've been far better to us than we could ever deserve. In a moment, in an act of worship, we will give to you our tithes and our offerings. We'll celebrate your faithfulness. We'll rejoice in your bounty of grace and goodness to us. And we'll give. Not because we have to or are forced to, but God, because we want to, to say thank you for all that you've done for us. So receive today our tithes, our offerings, and know in our hearts, God, they just represent a, a resounding thank you for all that you are and for all that you provide in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. Sings my soul, my Savior God, to 
sitting down here and we're singing one of the greatest songs of praise the church has ever known. How great thou art. And you know what? I may be deaf, but I do have my hearing aid in today. I can hear everything up there, but I can't hear diddly squat back here. So I'm going to give you another shot. Okay. So I don't know where to pick it up, John, probably at that last part of the chorus. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have a clue, but we're going to let them try to make up for what they've been lacking. Okay, so I'm going to go to the back and sing with them. Will that work? All right. All right. Chorus. That's the two chorus for the band. It's measure 20, the pickup to measure 20. Ready? And a one. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to some wires through the pews 
with a button up there, you can get them on their feet and make them, make them shout a little bit once in a while. I think it'd be fun. I just think it'd be fun. Well, God is good all the time. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to keep going in the series I've been preaching. And uh, today we're going to talk just for a few moments. Let me get all my stuff set here. Uh, we're going to talk for a few moments today about some things that you and I should not do. Now catch that. These are things to do not do as we seek to deal with the one who is doing everything that he can uh, to discourage us, to dissuade us, to draw us away uh, from the Father. Uh, let's take a look this morning at John chapter 10, verse 10. You will remember that we've been thinking about, talking about the fact that the thief, that is Satan, comes only to steal your joy, to kill your spirit, and to destroy your spiritual life. But Jesus said, I came that they, that's us, may have life and have that abundantly. Now, now I don't know about you, but if I have my choice between having my, uh, my joy stolen, my spirit killed, and my spiritual life destroyed, or having abundant life, I think I'd choose the latter, not the former. Amen? I mean, now, there is a choice there. We, we do get to make that choice. And then we read kind of a little bit why it's so important that we make the right choice, because in 1 Peter chapter 5, 8, Peter writes, Be sober-minded. Be watchful. In other words, beware. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. I uh, have had one of those weeks. Everything in my life happens in threes, especially funerals. And um, I got to bury a saint Thursday. And on Friday morning, I got to uh, bury one of my dear friend's fathers who died unexpectedly this week. And then I got to bury a young man that uh, you've heard about in the news who uh, killed his grandmother and then was killed by our local police department. Interesting services, all three of them. One was absolutely filled with joy. One was filled with the recognition that a hole had been left that will never be filled, the death of a father. And one was filled with questions. And in that last one, I could see in so many places where the enemy was just prowling about, seeking whom he could devour, whose joy he could steal. whose spirit he could destroy. And I, I've wondered this week. How many of us take scriptures like that seriously? You see, I think too often we get lulled to sleep in the church. Everything's just going fine. Everything just seems to be all well and good. We don't have any pains or problems and, and life is just wonderful. And the little things we have to deal with along the way, well, they're nothing compared to what we see out there in the world. And so we just kind of nod off, if you will. And all the while, the enemy, the enemy, the enemy is prowling about, seeking whom he can devour. And it came about, as we were going on to the place of prayer, a certain maid, having a spirit of python, did meet us, who brought much employment to her masters by soothsaying. 
God breathes abundant life into us. And it is his breath in us that gives us the abundant life that Jesus promised. That's his breath that's just breathed into our spirits that lifts us, that transforms us, that renews us, that forgives us, that gives us new hope and new promise. But in contrast, when Satan begins to work on our lives, his goal is to steal that breath away. As a python squeezes the capacity for breath out of its victims, so the enemy of our souls seeks to squeeze the spirit's breath. Our capacity to know and to walk with and to live for God right out of us. Now, now over the last few weeks, I, I, I tried to share with you a, a few simple truths This morning, I want to give you one that I hope you'll take home with you, and that is this. If you give Satan an inch, he'll do his best to put the squeeze on your soul. And he will. You give him the tiniest of opportunities. You open the door just a crack. You slide those shutters apart just a tiny little bit. He'll find a way to to slither in and to begin to coil himself around you and squeeze the breath of God right out of you. The last two weeks, I've shared with you six signs that Satan may be at work seeking to squeeze the breath of God, the life of the Spirit out of you. We've we've talked about a loss of spiritual desire, struggles with the word getting into it or anything out of it, struggles with your prayer life, a lack of desire, a multitude of distractions, or, or feeling like you just aren't getting through. The, the ceilings are brass, and nothing seems to happen when you pray. Uh, we talked last week about the problem of stinking thinking, uh, wrestling with old habits and temptations, and pulling away from worship and godly relationships. This morning, I want to move past all of the places where Satan seeks to squeeze the life out of us and move towards five things that you and I must be careful not to do if we're going to break the enemy's attack. Now, now I want you to make sure you understand what's underlined there. We must be careful not to do these things. Things. Now, and I know what you might be thinking. The church is always against something. Well, you know what? When you hear these, you'll understand what I mean and why you should be against these things. Let's, let's begin with this first one. Do not forget who made you. First John 4 and 4 says, little children, you are from God and you have overcome them for he who is at work in you is greater than he who is at work in the world. Man, I wished we understood that. Man, I wished we got that. Never forget who made you. John read that this morning. We're we're fearfully and wonderfully made. God, with his own creative genius, fashioned us with his hands in our mother's womb. And he brought us forth with the direct intention that we would reflect him and his glory. 
Never forget. Do not forget who made you. Because when you remember who made you, you remember who stands with you when you stand in the face of the enemy. And greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Amen? We do believe that, don't we? I mean, we don't have to be overcome and overrun. We don't, we don't have to do that, do we? We can take a stand and say, I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you cannot touch me. You cannot invade my life. You have no place, no presence, no power over me. For as the psalmist declares, the righteous flourish like a palm tree. Wow. Now, now, you know what's amazing about palm trees? They stand in incredible storms. I don't know how. It's the weirdest thing. You know their root structure is only about that big around. They're just a ball. But when they plant them, they dig a hole and they plop the ball in the hole, kick a little sand around it, and they walk away. And yet in the storms, they stand. I can't figure that out. Except that that's how God designed them. And here the Lord says to you and to me that the righteous, Psalm 92, 12, flourish like the palm tree. And when Satan comes and slithers around us and seeks to squeeze the breath of God out of us, we must remember because we are his what Paul said in Romans 8 and 37 that in all of those times, in all of those things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen? I was listening a couple weeks ago when um, Miss Kristen was preaching and she talked about the fact that we're called to be Christians and to live like Christ. And, and somewhere in the midst of that sermon, she looked at you and she said, act like it. I, I kind of agree. I, I mean, really. And all that Satan tries to throw at us, we are more than conquerors. So why don't we act like it? We don't have to give in. We don't have to give up. We don't have to be overcome or overwhelmed because he has no power over us. Micah 7, 8 gives us a great word. He says, rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I'll rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be light to me. Wow. In other words... We better not forget who made us. Secondly, do not forsake the time and the place of prayer. As I grow in my own walk with the Lord, I have learned, especially in the last year or two, that there are two things that are critically important for my success spiritually the time of prayer and the place of prayer. You can't be haphazard when you set a time to pray. And yet, sadly, most of us deal with prayer like this. When I get time, when I get around to it, when it fits in my schedule, I'll get alone with God. And then we wonder why we live so defeated and so discouraged and are continually overwhelmed and overcome with the onslaughts of the enemy. If you don't set a time to come into the presence of the Lord, guess what? The enemy will make sure you don't have time. That's the way he works. And so this morning, the one thing I would tell you is you've got to have a time set when you go to the Lord in prayer. Now, I know the first objection. Paul says, pray without ceasing. In other words, I don't have to have a specific time. Really? Did you notice that in the life of Christ, he always found time to get away and get alone with the Father? 
Over and again in the Gospels, we read that. There was a specific time that Jesus went to the Lord in prayer. One of the things that made the Jewish nation so strong is they understood that there was a time for prayer. And when it was time to pray, they went to the Lord. Now, let let me share something with you that literally scares the daylights out of me. In the rise of Islam around the world, do you know what the one thing is they stand on to make them strong? The time of prayer. And when the call to prayer happens, it doesn't matter where they are and what they're doing. Their prayer mat comes out and they kneel and they go prostrate before the Lord with their eyes focused towards Mecca. And we think that weird. I've been in airports where right in the middle of all the crowds of people, here's a guy on his face prostrate before the Lord on a prayer shawl with his head pointed towards Mecca, praying to Allah, asking him to give him power and wisdom. Why don't we do that? When is your time to pray. And then on the flip side of that also is where do you pray? There was a Christian movie that came out a couple years ago that kind of swept the church by storm and it was it was all built around a prayer closet. You remember the movie? And I mean, all of a sudden, people were taken and they were cleaning out closets. They were getting rid of shoes and clothes and everything else to make room in a closet. And people were thinking they were weird because now they were going into a closet and shutting the door and going before the Lord. What's wrong with that? Can I tell you something? If there is anything in the room where I'm praying, I get distracted. I mean, I'm just kind of one of those random guys that just has these thoughts going every which way but loose. And so when I go to prayer, guess what? I have to be in a place where there's nothing to distract me. Because guess what? Your pastor's a shipwreck of distraction if there's anything in the room. Now, now, now I've I've learned to do, it's taken me a while, but I've gotten to the place where where I understand what it means when Jesus says, when you go into your inner room and you shut the door and you pray in secret to your father, he hears you. 1999, I stood at the Western Wall in Jerusalem praying. On my right was a Hasidic Jew. On my left was a Hasidic rabbi. The Hasidic Jew on my right was standing there and praying intently to the Lord at the wall. The rabbi wasn't in the motion. I don't understand the motion. It just kind of freaked me out a little bit. But the man on my left, he took his talit, his prayer shawl, and he pulled it up off his shoulders and he brought it up over his head. And he bowed his head before the Lord. And in a place where there was no distraction and nothing to be seen, he did business with God. I have a tallit sitting on the right-hand side of my desk in my office. And on those days when my world is so bum-fuzzled and so messed up and I'm so distracted, you know what I do? I do what the old rabbi taught me. I put it on my shoulders and pull it up over my head. And I do business with God. Don't forsake the time and the place of prayer. Because it's only when we stand with the Father that we can truly overcome the enemy of our souls. Number three, don't forsake 
the place of power. Psalm 20, verse 1 says, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble, and may the name of God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. Hebrews 10 and 25 says that we should consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting our meeting together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day of the Lord drawing near. Do not forsake the place of power. The assembly, the gathering place we call the church. There, there, there's an incredible passage of scripture that I want you to look at with me real quick this morning. Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, I want you to look down at uh, verse 42. Acts chapter 2 and, and verse 42. Now, now this is the brand new church. These folks have just gotten Jesus. These folks have just been filled with the Holy Spirit. These folks have just figured out that what God chooses to do in their lives is change them forevermore. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and all came around upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Wow. That happened in church. And we come in on Sunday morning and we find our place in our pew. God forbid anybody sits in my pew. And we endure the music and get through the prayer and put up with the sermons. And then we go to Sunday school, not able hardly to wait for lunchtime. Now I'm real honest. Endless shrimp at Red Lobster sounds really good today. Just saying. But I need what happens here more. I need to be in the place of power. With God's power people in the presence of the Almighty. You do realize that where two or three are gathered, he is in the midst of them. Did you know that God's here this morning? I mean, did you know that he is physically here? Now, now there's probably somebody in the crowd saying, point him out. Okay, let me do that. He's in you, John Miller, right now. He's right inside of you. He's all over you. I can see it in your eyes. He's in you, Rick Schlipp. I can see him in you. I can see his presence. I can see his power at work. I, I can look over here and I can see my beloved. And, and I know God's with you. He came in with you this morning and he's been sitting with you there all morning. And I can see his presence. I want to be in the place of power. And folks, we, we, we get to the place where we let everything else get in front of it. Now, I'm really happy Church at Salina first starts at 9.30. I'm really happy. In Emporia, we started at 10.45. And this time of the year, especially this day, this time of the year, at about 10 minutes to 12, the same thing happened. The two back rows of the church all got up and walked out. I mean, they just got up and walked out. You know why they got up and walked out? Because at 12.05, the Chiefs kicked off. And God forbid we'd miss the kickoff. And my wife will tell you, I let that happen for two weeks. And the third week, they got up to walk out, and I said, y'all sit down. 
Did you not hear me? I said, sit down. That game's going to start whether you're watching it or not. And if you're not smart enough to have a DVR, then shame on you. Never had to deal with that issue again. We had a soccer field in, in, in Emporia. And on any Sunday morning, more than 5,000 people would gather at those soccer fields. Every Sunday morning. Uh, there was a doctor in town, James Barnett. He, he came to me and he said, Pastor John, I, I know you care about the youth of the community. And I was wondering, I sit on the board of Trisa Soccer League and, and, and none of these folks go to church. Would you be willing to come out and 30 minutes before the first game, would you be willing to do a devotional in the stands with the people that are there? And I said, man, I would love that on Sunday morning. He said, well, it will happen between 9 and 9.30. You can't get past 9.30. It's between 9 and 9.30. Would, would you be willing to do it? I said, absolutely. And, and he said, okay, I'm going to go to the board. And he called me a week later, and through his tears, this is what he said. They don't want the church. And they don't want you. That's why they're at the soccer field. So keep the church out of it. And 5,000 people every Sunday met to worship their God. A little white ball spinning across the field. I say, Pastor, you're kind of getting a little close in some areas. I know I am. But this week I have watched people do battle with the enemy of their souls. In ways I'd never seen people battle with the enemy of our soul. I saw stuff this week that I have never seen in my life before. And you know what was common in every one of those situations? Not one of those people would ever darken the door of a church. We don't need it, we don't want it, so don't even talk to us about it. Too bad, every funeral I preach, I share the gospel. You're gonna hear it, whether you want to hear it or not. Because you know what, something happens when you step into the place of power, because God is here. Don't forsake the power of partnership. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 10 makes this incredible statement. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Ecclesiastes 4 and 12 Though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A three cord, threefold cord is not quickly broken. Solomon was trying to communicate an incredible point that Reuben Welch put into the form of a book. We really do need each other. Do not forsake the power of partnership. Forty years ago today, I gave my heart to Jesus. Forty years ago today. And over the last 40 years, I have not lived one moment of my life with Christ without a spiritual partner, a mentor, someone to walk alongside with me. Someone I could talk to someone I could share with, someone I could spend time with, someone who could counsel me, someone who could correct me, someone who'd get in my face, 
Someone who, when I was going through the valley, was there for me. I have seen those words in Ecclesiastes lived out. In January of 2000, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. The doctors told us it was a terminal illness that no matter what we did, he would die. It was certain. During that season in my life, I, I, I really needed someone. I, I had a prayer group that I met with every Saturday morning. I, I actually fixed breakfast for all the men of the church on Saturday morning. Every Saturday morning we had a, a group that got together and those guys hung with me and prayed with me, but, but I really wasn't really close to any of them at that time. I, I had Gene Williams in my corner and he was my mentor, but God sent a man from across town at the Friends Church to walk with me. His name was Keith Davis. He was the clerk of the Friends Church. Now, I can't really describe how their government works except to say that the clerk in the Friends Church would be somewhere between the pastor and the, the secretary of the church board in the Nazarene Church. They kind of ran the show. Everything that happened happened through them. And Keith walked away from that position and left his church to come to ours because God said to him, John Philippi needs you. Now, I knew Keith in passing. We were friends, but, but never had been really close. I knew he walked with the Lord, but, but he shows up on our doorstep and he says, I'm here for you. God told me, I am here for you. And I can tell you 19 years later, still for me. My phone will ring in the midst of a dark time without him even knowing what's going on and he'll say, hey John, what's, going, what, what, what's happening? He's my spiritual partner, my mentor, my friend. Over the last seven or eight years here at Salina First, I've been blessed with a group of men on Tuesday nights that, that I meet with, and I think it's safe to say we could not make it without each other. We have walked each other through some really dark waters. And we've always come out on top. And I will tell you this morning that if you don't have a trusted spiritual friend, a man with a man, a woman with a woman, I'm not talking your spouse here, folks. You got to have a good spouse too. But somebody that you can walk with who, who will walk with you. You're missing one of the greatest tools God can use to help you thwart the attacks of the enemy. There's a final one that I want to share this morning that's near and dear to my heart. And that is do not disconnect from pastoral protection. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 7 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning or trepidation, for that would be of no advantage to you. My greatest joy and at times my greatest sorrow is that I'm a shepherd. And God has placed me and has placed John Luce among you as those who one day will stand before the Lord and give an account for what we did as shepherds while among you. I will answer for every word that I have preached, every word of counsel that I have given, 
every piece of direction that I have offered, everything that I have done. And in like manner, so will John Luce. For we are your shepherds. We do not take that place lightly. Now I'm going to be honest and tell you there's a whole lot of Monday mornings where I quit. Over 33 years, I've probably written three or 400 resignation letters. Most of them have wound up in the trash can. A few of them have wound up in, the, in a file that I keep locked away just for hilarity's sake. But come Tuesday morning, I always re-engage. Because I'm a shepherd. It's an interesting thing about shepherds. They live to keep an eye out for the enemy. They're always on guard. I have in my home, along the stairwell going to the basement where my office is, a shepherd's staff. It was given to me by my father-in-law, who was a shepherd. He tended sheep. He taught me a lesson when he gave that to me. And this is what he said. You'll notice that on one, one end, John, there is a hook. And there are going to be times you're going to have to put that hook around the neck of somebody and pull them in out of danger. Just as I do with my lambs and my sheep. The other end, well, it's just a straight, straight shaft. And there are going to be times that you're going to need that to fight off the enemies that would seek to steal your sheep from you. Now, my father-in-law wasn't an intensely spiritual man. We know that his heart was right with God before he died, but along his journey, there were some times where he and well, he and the church just didn't get along. But when he took me to Yoder, Kansas, and he got me that shepherd's crook, that day he was one of the most spiritual men I've ever known. Because he taught me the importance of my place in the world. I'm a shepherd. And when I say to you this morning, do not disconnect from your pastoral protection. What I mean by that is this. There are going to be times I'm going to come alongside you and hold your hand and we're just going to have a great time together. And there are going to be times when you're not really going to like me. Because I'm going to get in your face and I'm going to say things that you're just not willing to listen to. And you certainly don't want to hear. Even if deep down you know they're right. And you're going to get mad. I've had some people leave the churches I pastored. Because they weren't going to put up with the word that I spoke to them. And I'm sorry for them. Because God called me to be their shepherd. Psalm 23 and 4 is, is a beautiful part of the shepherd's psalm where it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you, my Lord, protect me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That image of the shepherd's staff, that image of the rod speaks of care and correction. Exactly what God provides to me. There are times he wraps that little crook around my neck and yanks me back in, out of danger. 
away from stinking thinking or thoughts or feelings or emotions or a spirit of negativity where I just, I just wanted to lash out. He, he rips me back because he knows that if I stay in that place, the spirit of Python will squeeze the life of God's breath out of me. And there have been times he's had to spin that thing around and use the other end to fight off the enemy. When Satan attacked in ways that I never even dreamed possible could happen in the church. And even as he's cared for me, so he calls me and John Luce to care for you. Do not disconnect from pastoral protection. Simple truth I want you to remember this morning. If you give Satan an inch, he'll do his best to put the squeeze on your soul. And in the process of making certain that doesn't happen, begin breaking the bonds that bind. Don't forget who made you. Don't forsake the time and the place of prayer. Don't forsake the place of power. Don't forsake the power of partnership. Do not disconnect from pastoral protection. Don't forget, if you give Satan an inch, he'll do his best to put the squeeze on your soul. May God help us to be not hearers only, but doers also of his word. Amen? Father, thank you for your word to us. Help us to do more than hear, but now to act it out, to live this truth that the enemy of our soul's bonds can be broken, that we can stand as more than conquerors through Christ who gives us strength. And it's in his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Thanks for worshiping with us this morning. Have an incredible day. Enjoy Sunday school. And remember, tonight starts at 5 o'clock. It is a sandwich that we need you to bring. Sandwich and chips and all the sweets that you can find.